read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners Welcome back. It's another week at Read Me Romance, and we have a brand new book from Isla Glass, who has been on the podcast with us before. Um, She brought us a new book called Boss of Me that she said in her email was super dirty. She was super excited to have it on here with us. So um, we'll tell you about all of her great stuff in just a few minutes. But um, but yeah, she uh, brought this one. And I think it even says in the book blurb that we have, it says, if you like Insta Love of Alexa Riley and Over the Topness of Jessica Kane, then you may like this short story. So nice. there you go. That's what that's what your preview is to be expected of. <laughs> so um, something I want to mention right off the top is we have our book boxes are live. So if you are interested in the Read Me Romance Summer Book Box, you can grab those now on our website, um, readmeromance.com. They're on so, there. So. I actually want to make a note about something about the book box. Mm-hmm. So um, I said, you know, that's the best vibrator I've ever used before, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. In that book box. So one day, I don't know what I was doing. It was like on the counter or something. I was like, oh, I'm going to clean this, like thoroughly clean it. Mm-hmm. And I made the mistake of, like, I have a bunch of eyelash cleaners. Mm -hmm. So I took the eyelash cleaner thing, it's like a stick, and I pushed it down in there. But I pushed it too far. Like, I pushed through the thing. So now it doesn't suction correctly. Oh, no. So then I got mad. I was like, God damn it. So I get online and I find it. The same one. Mm -hmm. They're like 40, 50 bucks online by themselves on Amazon. I get it. It looked like the same pink as ours. Mm -hmm. And the packaging and all of that looked the same. But it was like a darker pink. And it is nowhere as good. Really? As the hot pink one. So then I went and searched for, I was like, maybe it's the hot pink one. I don't (laughs) understand. And I can't find the hot pink one. I can only find this bright-ish pink one. It's kind of pinkish red. And I swear to God, it's totally different. Really? It's not the same? It is not the same, but it's like the same box and stuff. That's why I don't Uh understand it. I'm like, I don't, I don't know why. I don't know either. the color is just a little different, but it's just a little-ish, not as good as that one that was in the box. So you're going to have to buy a book box. Is that what you're saying? (laughs) (laughs) If I see your name pop up, I won't say anything, okay? I'll just be like, you got it. I'll send you one. I wish we had extras. I'd send you an extra one. I'll see what we got left. (laughs) I usually order, like, exactly enough swag for just to do the book boxes. Like, Mm -hmm. my sister was up here um, earlier, and she was like, oh, I really like these cups. I was like, don't touch the cups. I was like, I got to, I got to make sure I got enough for everything. <laughs> but actually I told her, and then I was like, no, I think you can have one because I, I, I don't know if you remember when we talked about when we were ordering the cups originally, the ones I was supposed to get like fell through and they, because they couldn't get enough. And then, so I went to a second vendor and I ordered them and they were like, okay, it's actually going to be cheaper if you order like 50 more because mm-hmm. you can get like a, a solid unit. And I was like, oh, okay. So as soon as the book boxes are sold, if there's any of the cups left, then mm-hmm. we'll just put those up on the website if anybody wants to purchase those because they're Peyton's so freaking so mine. cute. They are yeah. really cute. They're so cute. They're pink and glittery, but they have, you know, the Read Me Romance logo on them. But on the lid, it's kind of like a like a domed lid, like when you get a milkshake. It's like that, but it has kitty cat ears on it. And it's mm-hmm. so freaking cute. I love it. I actually posted a video of unboxing one. Um, the book box that's in Read Me Romance headquarters. And I think I posted it to Instagram on my reels on on the Read Me Romance Instagram. So you can check it out there if you want to see what's inside the box, if you don't mind being spoiled. So go grab that. Um, so, yeah, they're, uh, they're up on the website. You can go check it out at readmeromance.com. And the other thing that's new on the website that I wanted to mention was you put a tab up for signings. Do you want to tell everybody about that? <laughs> it's just a tab that lists um, all the different signings. Anytime somebody sends some or adds one, I can add it on there. And it just lists the signings for like this year and next year. And I have it broken up to signings in the United States 
And then I have broken up for events that are just for authors because there are some just author events every year. Mm -hmm. And then I did international. Yeah. So there's a lot of them on there that you can see. I mean, there were several that I didn't realize were so close to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, oh, that's not too far. And that one's not too bad, you know. And there's some big ones that are happening too that, you know, it's just good to know about. So if you're planning for signings next year, you know, some of those bigger signings, they happen every year around that same time. So you can go ahead and look and Mel has already linked like the website on there and put the dates and everything. So it's just at a quick glance. It's a, it's a really like, it's cool. It's a, it's a nice tool to have on there too. So I thought that was really neat that you added it. So um, the other thing I want to talk about today that may take a minute to discuss is that I read a book and I just finished it yesterday. Last night, I stayed up till like 2 a.m. listening to it because I just didn't want it to end. But mm -hmm. it was OK. So I don't know how to talk about this other than to just like just like get it all out. Just like blah. But <clears throat> excuse me, it's um, it's called The Wartime Matchmakers by Lauren Smith. And I talked about it on the podcast the last time she was with us. And it is an interesting read because I, while it is a romance, there is closed door. There's no like descriptive sex or anything like that. It's just alluded to. So it's not in that. But as several times while I was reading it, I thought about when you said you read The Secret by Julia Quinn or not, not by Julia Quinn, by um, Garwin. Yes, Julie Garwin. Um, Garwood, but um, when you read The Secret, that how much you love the friendship. Mm -hmm. And that's what I kept thinking when I was reading or listening to the audio of this book was it was such a great story about friendship because it's these, it starts out, it's these two women and this is right in like 1939. It's right before World War II starts or it's 1937, whatever it is. I forget the exact year when the book starts, but it's right before war, World War II starts. They meet at a party and this one girl has the idea to start a matchmaking service because she's really good at like matchmaking people, like their friends and stuff. And the other girl is like really business savvy and she's like, we got this. So they meet for the first time at this party and they decide to go into business together. So it was kind of cool, but it's based on a true story. This actually happened. So these best, like these girls became best friends. They started this business together. And so as the story is told, it's like, I think it's like 18 hours in the audio, 18 or 20 hours is mm -hmm. long. But as it's told, <clears throat> they start to go through World War II and the book takes you all the way. It's like six years, I think. It goes all the way into the end of World War II. In yeah. a long way, it talks about all the stories of the people that they match along the way. And they're all based on true stories. So like the amount of history and research that Lauren mm -hmm. Smith did on this book is crazy, but it didn't feel like I was reading, you know, a biography or something like it, yeah. it felt like I was being told love stories over and over and over. And they were so sweet and beautiful and like, but there's moments in the book where there are tragedies and it's so sad. And like I cried, like at several points in the book, I cried. And then like, there was just like these beautiful relationships that are made, like not even like, um, like for example, uh, they're looking for a secretary, like they've grown and they need a secretary. And one of the girls ends up finding like this woman on the street who's being harassed and they bring her in and they hire her. And she's just like fled from Poland because she's Jewish. And they're like, you know, arresting people there for being Jewish. And it's like, all of this is based on like true things that happen to like, um, Lauren Smith talks at the end of the book, um, there's like author's notes and she discusses where she got her research from, where these stories are based on and the people they're based on. And cause she changes their names for the book. Mm -hmm. And one of her close friends was a, a Holocaust survivor. And like part of this story was based on them and their family. And like, it was just, it was, so it's kind of like these makeshift families that happened during World War II. And the whole time I'm thinking, I'm, I'm reading this too. I'm just picturing my grandmother because she was this age, you know, she was early twenties when this was all happening and falling in love. And it was like, you know, all the things that go on about like, you know, how, how they live like everyday lives and yet they're still being bombed in their city in London. And it's, you know, it's crazy, but it's, it like uh, she talks about um, a couple of the the big battles that take place, like you know that like Normandy, yeah, and um, stuff like that. Like 
there were several like historical events that she wove into the story that were true. And so I just had the best time listening to this book, even though, you know, it wasn't like a steamy romance, you know, by any means. I had no idea what I was getting into when I started this book, but I was so happy that I listened to it and read it because like I said, the friendship was so great in it. And the couples that, you know, fall in love and there's, you know, this is, this is a little spoiler. If you don't want anything, you can just fast forward like, like 30 seconds. But there's like, um, there's a moment where this one woman is going to meet this man, like they've been matched up and he just disappears and doesn't come back. And she goes to the bureau to these girlfriends and she's like, I, he just stood me up. He was an ass, you know, didn't say asshole, but she, he was a jerk and blah, blah, blah. And come to find out he was hit by a car. And that's why he didn't come back. Like he met her and was like, oh, I'll go grab us a table and then gets hit by a car and gets taken to the hospital. And that was like a true event, you know, like that the matchmakers talked about that really happened. This woman came in upset and the guy was actually hit by a car and that's why he didn't come back. So. It was things like that where they're just these little snippets of stories that are so sweet, but the way it's told is really cool and be a hard it's time different. to fall in love. Yeah, yeah. But honestly, it was it was so I, this is the part that I found so fascinating was that they were so busy. They would get hundreds of letters a day because people were desperate for love because mm -hmm. there was so much tragedy happening around them that they kept thinking like life is short. You know, they said the lifespan, I think, of one of the the aviators in London at the time was four months, yeah. like the, from the time they entered to the time they died. So it was like these guys, these, you know, pilots and stuff were coming in. It was like, I need a wife wife me up, you know, I mean, so because they just were so desperate for someone to come back to. Yeah. And I just thought, Oh my God. Like, I mean, it was, it was tragic, but beautiful. And, you know, there's a moment at the end of it where um, it's during the author's notes where Lauren Smith has written out where she said she thought a lot about her grandmother and she wrote um, some of this. There was a scene where she wrote that was based on her own grandmother's experience and she thought, like, you know, one of the main characters has a baby at the end of it. And um, she says, you know, I wonder if she even thought about it later that she had just survived World War II. The war, the war ended and she had a baby that would grow up to go into Vietnam and not come home. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, it was just it was moments like that in the book where it just hit me in the feels, you know. And again, I just kept thinking about my grandmother when I was reading it, you know, mm -hmm. because she would have been that age. And so it was, it was so good. I, I cannot recommend this book enough, even though like this, this isn't a traditional romance in the sense of it. There, there's so much romance in the book, but it's not, it's not like anything I've read before because it's based in history. Yet there is some elements of like storytelling in it. And it was just, it, it had so many emotions in it too. And I just, I really loved it. I didn't rush through it. I mean, it was really long, but I would just put it in the car, you know, when I would go for a drive or something, I had to, you know, go to Charlotte, which is like an hour from here. I would just put it on and listen to it casually. But it was like every chapter was its own story sort of, but there was like the friendship through the whole thing. So it was a great book. I loved it. Loved it. Oddly, speaking of war, um, did you see the UK Ukraine's president make a um, a statement the other day? He made like he wished America and happy end of uh, independence, Valdemir. Did he really? Oh my god, it's like a three minute. And you know how over time people have talked about how the American flag when they see it sometimes they cringe a little bit. Yeah, because if you're like, oh, it's automatically like. Republican, some of the he made a beautiful like two and a half minute quick speech that even thinking about it hit me like square in the chest. Yeah. Like it was a reminder of like everything America's been through, everything that people have fought for and died for and him saying America stands for freedom and they're happy to be an ally. And when they're fighting that they're fighting for freedom too. It was really mm -hmm. like, I was like, Oh my God. 
Yeah, it was like moving. It was very moving in yeah. a very quick way. Mm -hmm. It's That's worth awesome. a watch. Like when I watched it, I was like, damn. It's the president of Ukraine? Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I haven't seen it. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was kind of the same way where, you know, when people are in these desperate, desolate situations, you know, that there is, there's bravery and there's, you know, honor and stuff that come out of it. And it, it was really moving. It was, it was a great book. So I can imagine like writing it, what that would take out of you, you know, but having experienced it even like, you know, to be in a place like Ukraine that's experiencing that currently, you know, what that, what those emotions would do. So, you know, it's, I think it's worth the read just to be more cognizant of like what really happens to people during war, you know, what truly happens to them. So, and, and not in like, and it wasn't told from like a horrific aspect, you know, of like all the, it wasn't just tragedy, you know, it was told from, a, from two friends that wanted to help people find love. And I thought that was just such a, a beautiful way to look at it, to experience it. So yeah, that was really cool. So have you read anything lately? That's good. <laughs> yeah. I, anything else? Anything. I know I just, I had a book come in last night at midnight. Yeah. I stand across that book. It hit my Kindle. I was like, oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> I had, um, I don't know if I talked about it last week. I know I talked about going to try to find my Mariana Zapata book. Yeah. But I finished um, Allie Hazelwood's new one, Love Theoretically, and it was fantastic. I actually thought about, you know, the, um, the lady on TikTok, her name's Elise Myers. Do you know her? She was the one that has like the Taco Bell story where like she goes and eats like a hundred tacos or her boyfriend, the, the guy she was seeing ordered a hundred tacos, but she's really cool. She's got dark curly hair. Mm -hmm. She's tall, slim. But anyways, um, I thought about her the whole time I was reading this because the heroine in the book is a people pleaser and she just tries to change herself mm -hmm. into who people need her to be. Yeah. So she's like, oh, this person right now needs somebody sympathetic or they need somebody that's going to, you know, do this and this, whatever. So the heroine kind of like emulates the person she wants to be. So just a huge people pleaser, which Elise Myers has said she did that for every guy she ever liked. She tried to be the person that they would want her to be. And in the book, it's the hero that sees her and calls her on her bullshit. He's like, why are you pretending to be? all of these other people. And he's the first person that's ever noticed she does that. And so he like holds her to kind of call her on her bullshit and like hold her to a higher standard. Like you need to respect yourself and you know, that kind of thing. And so it made me think of her like while I was reading it, but it was such a great book. I really enjoyed it. I think out of all the, the books I've read of hers, I think that's like the the sixth book I think I've read of hers now, that's probably one of my top favorites. It was so well written and the hero was just perfect. He was perfect. So I think a lot of women do that. The shift yeah. in, into something they're not. I had a friend mm -hmm. that it would even do it with other friends, not yeah. just even with men. It was mm -hmm. like whoever she was around was who she was like. Yeah. And it's because I think it, you know, that some people are just so, I don't know, I don't want to say, I, not really I, desperate for it, but just like want to be validated, you know? I also think that sometimes people just don't really know who they are and yeah. they don't realize they don't know who they are. I could agree with that for sure. Yeah. That they're not even, they might even be totally aware that they're doing it. Yeah. I think a lot of it in this book too was the heroine just didn't know who she was. She didn't really know who she wanted to be away from the people pleaser, you know? Instead of stepping back and saying, hey, what do I want to do today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that something I want to participate in? And she didn't want to really hurt. Wanna... Yeah. She didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings by not being the person that they wanted her to be. So it was like. She felt by like saying what she wanted would make someone else upset. So she would never say the things she wanted, you know, like, oh, well, he likes hamburgers. So let's go eat hamburgers. And he was like, just tell me what you want. I don't care about what I want, you know? Yeah. So it was kind of one of those things. So it was just, it was different and I enjoyed it. And I love that the conflict in the book was really based on her standing up for herself yeah. And that was like their, you know, sort of main beef. It was, it was a great premise. So.
So yeah, I really enjoyed that one. But um, I was trying to see, I also have another one um, that I wanted to mention on my Audible because I think it was like, I guess it's free if you have, um, if you have Audible, I don't know what it's called. I can't remember what it's called. It's like they're lending the ones light. with the yellow tags across. Yeah, them. it's basically the ones that it's like their lending library. So if you have an Audible account, you can download them. You don't have to pay for them or use a credit. And the King Spinster Bride by Ruby Dixon is on there. So I just wanted to mention that too because I saw it the other day and I was like, I don't think I've listened to the audio on that. So I just hit it and it just pulled up on my Audible account. And I was like, okay, cool. So that's one of them. And. There was one the other day that I pulled up, and now I can't remember what it was. But I just wanted to mention that one, too, So while I was thinking on it. Do you have any books you need to recommend before I move on? <laughs> I didn't mean to talk over you on my love theoretically chit-chat. But no. I knew you said you had one to hit your Kindle. Yeah, it's just so my Kindle. I haven't read it yet, but oh, okay. the book bio, because I said, I've always said, you know, some of Sam Crescent's books I have to skip over. Mm-hmm. But this one had very much a book bio that I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to like this one. Like, he's taking this girl in, and she's his, and this is not going to be like yeah. a push and pull, ignore her kind of thing. <laughs> so. I like that. It's on the new release post. Yes. Go check that out. All the good <laughs> ones are on there. <laughs> all right. Let's get into Isla Glass and all her great stuff. Um, I'll read you her book bio. Isla Glass is a Canadian romance writer. She enjoys books from Alexa Riley to Suzanne Brockman. She loves writing stories as well as reading them. Her favorite book of all time is Mackenzie's Mission by Linda Howard. Things she also likes are the color green, wolves, books, cars, and the DC universe. Dirty Work is her first book. There you go. I like that. It's just like a quick, da, da, da. this is my favorite <laughs> book. This is it. Like it. Go. All right, the book that we're about to play for you today is called Boss of Me, and I'll read you the blurb for that too. My new boss wants me in his bed. Desperate for a new job after being fired, I took I took a housekeeper position for a stranger. Little did, I, little did I know that my new boss was the man responsible for my unemployment. The sexy billionaire with sea blue eyes and a chiseled face with a penchant for a nickname. Got, he got me fired once, but I'll do anything to keep my job this time around. Sounds sexy. <laughs> Boss of Me is quick, dirty, over-the-top, insta-love romance with a possessive hero, age gap, forbidden romance between a housekeeper and her new boss who calls her bunny. I boss forgot. Of, oh, wait. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, I forgot. I did do something I should probably mention that people have seen on TikTok. Yeah. Um, the Flex app. Yeah. And the real, real app where you see these dramatic clips of episodes of these like over dramatic movies that are from mm -hmm. Wattpad books. Have you uh -huh. seen those? No. You have to have seen them. Okay. And I'm they're sure. like, you yeah, watch like these episodes of like right now, what's big is the wolf one. Oh, yeah. Okay. I know what you're talking the about. Alpha yes. One. So I went yes. on and I watched like three of these you know yeah. the husband one where she marries and why he's in the coma yes and everybody's mm -hmm. like what's happening but there's like 60 episodes each episode is like a minute long yes uh -huh. a minute or three. and you have to go through like 60 episodes you have to buy all these coins. oh yeah it's a ton of money to do it yeah well one offers you a membership which if you're gonna oh, watch okay. two or more mm -hmm. buy the hundred dollar membership okay if you're gonna watch two or more which okay. I should have done, but I'm not gonna. I'm not going back. I wasn't mm -hmm. that impressed. Like a lot of things are left out. Like every episode ends in a weird kind of cliffhanger, and you're like, "What's next? What's next? What's next?" But some of the guys were like, it was either the guys were really bad or really good. Okay. Like the alpha one, the hero is really good. And the one with the husband she marries in a coma is really good. And there's another guy where he's like her ward or whatever. He's terrible. I was like, oh, my God. But so, like I said, I probably spent a lot of money on watching like three or four of their movies. Mm -hmm. And why I couldn't stop scrolling through when I started them, when I was done, I was kind of like, that really wasn't worth it. Well, but what sucks. I find interesting is. I don't know how this company is doing this, how they're not finding or people don't have spoilers or just telling people what happened. 
Oh, is that they not? Tell you, no, you can't find them anywhere. Because some of them, I was like, I don't even want to watch the rest of this. Can you just tell me what happens at the end? I yeah. can't find it anywhere. <laughs> and I feel like I could tell you some of them in like five minutes. Yeah. So I was. So tell are you? Is this a warning for people not to do this? <laughs> I I don't think it's worth the money. Yeah. And sometimes they look very clickable. Even I've almost been tempted back to mm -hmm. see one of them because I'm like, oh, they do. They're very catchy. Yeah. The acting is not good. They use the same characters for each movie, just different roles. Yeah. And the love just isn't fulfilling. It's like when they finally get to the end. It's mm -hmm. like the last two episodes, they really understand their love for each other. And it's like, boom, over. Oh, uh, that's it. You don't get to live in the love. There, you, there's no living and there's love. Mm -hmm. There's no like, what's ha no epilogue. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nothing. So it's kind of underwhelming in the end. You're like, oh, I finally know what happened after seeing all these teaser fucking TikToks. But now I'm kind of like, was that really worth all that time and money? Mm-hmm. So don't let them trap you. That's what I'm saying. Because <laughs> there's one that doesn't offer a membership, and you'll end up spending like forty dollars for a movie. Oh, that sucks. So, That's a lot. yes, mm -hmm. it is. They're smart. There, somebody's paying for it because they keep making them. Yeah, I see the ads. I've seen everywhere. several. They're, yeah, their TikTok ads. I know what you're very, talking about now. Very good, but it is very melodramatic. Not great acting. Really stupid. <laughs> I'm I'm calling it really stupid in parts, and I write stupid shit all the time. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write the corniest shit, and I'm just like, Fuck. you're like, this is too much. This is unbelievable. Yeah. That's how you maybe know it's, it's bad. Maybe it's because seeing people act it out is very eye rolling. Yes, Especially that's when very cheesy. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> but. Okay. Right, I'm just giving that warning because I know everybody's seen them. No, I appreciate and I it. I bit the bullet <laughs> and I watched some of them. I've seen a couple of, on Instagram. I've seen a couple of ads on there. Like the more you talked about them, the more I was like, oh, yeah, I've seen those. But like I've never clicked over to, to watch more of them. So mm -hmm. I guess it's good that I have not. <laughs> um, Let me see. Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple more things. Um, Boss of Me is a standalone. Um, the book you're about to listen to is uh, a standalone and not connected to anything else. You can get the ebook with a little bonus epilogue by signing up for Ally Glass's newsletter. She'll be sending an email out on July 13th containing the link to the book and it's free. So all you have to do is sign up for the newsletter. She'll send you this ebook free and it has the bonus epilogue in it. Mary's Submission. Um, which is a student teacher romance and Torin, which is an alien romance will be free for the week of July 10th through the 14th. Um, Jatari is 99 cents, which is an aliens enemies to lovers romance. The heroine in Torin has a best friend who gets laid and falls in love with her alien in Jatari. Jatari. So those are connected. So the, the first one is free, the Torin, and then the second one, Jatari is 99 cents. Um, for her new releases, uh, Just Like Heaven and A Hot Housewife Summer are brand new. Um, Just Like Heaven is a sapphic romance, which is female, female. And A Hot Wife Summer is a hot wife erotica. Um, another new release is a book called The Dirty Collection. It has all the books in the Dirty series and has an extra novella in it. That's it's a um, my ex cheated on me, so I lost my V to his dad. And it's five books in total. So oh, okay. I was like, that's awesome. Um, her giveaway this week is a signed paperback with some swag. So make sure you enter it. And her Facebook group is Glass Heart Romance. So yeah, we'll have all this down in the show notes. So make sure you check it out. I'm just going to say, I realized which book sucked me into all of those. It was, have you seen the one where the guy is like, they're having sex and she's blindfolded and he keeps like picking her up and he's like, fucking her. Yeah, she, she has to fuck him every night for a contract and she has no. no idea who it is. I don't think so, no. Oh, that's the one that pulled me in, which I'm sure a lot of no. other people see. It's like a hot scene where he like picks her up and she's got this mask and like slams her down on the bed. <laughs> that one, no. There's like two hot scenes. They don't even know who each other are and then all of a sudden they're like together and I'm like, how do they come together? <laughs> like, So there's plot holes is what you're yeah, saying. Like, I'm huge. shocked. I was like, how did we get to here to here? <laughs> I'm shocked. 
But yeah, that was the one that got me, which is probably getting a lot of other people. So just so you know, that was the best scene was the only scene when he lifted her up and giving you in the preview. Okay. And it's actually kind of a rough, mean sex scene, if you ask me, once it starts going. You're like, oh, no. Yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> All right. So let's play the first installment. Let's, let's get in. into it. All right. We'll see you guys on the other side. Bye. This is Boss of Me by Isla Glass. Read for you by Megan Kelly. Chapter One Brianna Most people are nervous about starting their first job. Unfortunately, I've had so many first jobs that, at this point, I'm not nervous, and I expect to get fired this afternoon. I don't know what it is about me that causes them to fire me so often. Maybe I just have one of those faces. In the last three years, I've been fired four times. One time I got laid off rather than fired. The second time it was because a co-worker threw me under the bus and I spilled coffee all over the client this last time. It was a mistake, I swear. But the manager had warned me, one strike and I was out. It was nothing short of a miracle when I ran into a woman named Sophia looking for a housekeeper for her brother. She said he's mostly at work, leaving his bachelor pad all dusty and unloved. I told her I'd do anything, and she hired me. As a bonus, his apartment is around the block from where I live. It's one of those streets where one block is fancy high-rises, expensive coffee shops, and bougie stores for the rich and fabulous, then the next block is run-down buildings and shitty apartments. That's where I live. I painted my walls a bright color, but that doesn't cover the water stains or the high risk of one electrical malfunction from a fire. As I step into the elevator up into his apartment, I feel out of place. The elevator is ten times fancier than my apartment. It's mirrored, and I can see ten of me echoing on the walls. I look at my face closely, my badly applied eyeliner and dry lips. I put on some lip balm, but it tends to make it worse, even though it should make it better. Story of my life. When I left the orphanage at 18, they told me I had my whole life ahead of me, that the world was my oyster. They failed to tell me that a man with a top hat and cane wouldn't hand me my bag of riches. Instead, I was going to have to get it all by myself. And even then, it was still far away. I was told that my hard-working personality would benefit me, but it's only gotten me fired so far. The only good thing I have right now is my will to succeed. I will not give up. I refuse to. The elevator dings at the penthouse floor, and I step out. There is only one door in front of me. It's silver with gold outlining. God, the floor is so shiny that I can see up my skirt. There are fancy paintings on the walls on either side and a table with an orchid in the middle. It's elegant and fancy. Then there's me, wearing secondhand clothing and a bag I've carried around since I was six. Now at 22, it's the only consistent thing I've ever had. I cling to it as I put the metal key I was given into the lock and turn it. It clicks and as I push in the door, I'm greeted with the most fantastic apartment I've ever seen. The same reflective floor follows me as I shut the door behind me. The walls are metallic gray and lined with fancy art, paintings of beautiful people in beautiful clothing. Some with almost no clothing at all. My eyes fall upon a painting so lifelike, I think it's a photograph of a curvy brunette with doe eyes wearing a black bra and panties set, looking at me like she knows I'm staring at her, and she likes it. I look to the right and see a note on the table. It's from Sophia. Hi, Brianna. You will find cleaning supplies and everything you'll need in the small room under the stairs. Lock up after you leave. Here's a list of things to do. Clean the house. Dishes. Prepare a few meals. Or order in. Up to you. My brother won't care. Change sheets. Thanks, Sophia. I take the note and look around for the stairs. 
Behind me, there's a beautiful wooden spiral staircase leading to a second floor. Fuck, my apartment barely has one room, and this guy has two floors. Behind the stairs is a host of cleaning supplies. Each one is labeled to tell me what it's for. One is for the floor, and one is for windows. Then there's one for glass tables, which is different from wooden tables. I lay my bag on the ground and remove my coat, shoving it into one of the cubby holes against the wall, pulling out the soaps and brushes I'll need. If there's any job I could be good at, it's this one. I love cleaning. It's soothing to me. Cleaning up the clutter, removing all the gunk, and making it clean and pretty makes me feel better, like taking a breath of fresh air. Mr. Donnelly's house isn't really dirty, but as I wipe down the wood table and see it change color as it dries, it's similar. The dust goes away, and what's left is a surface clean enough to eat food off of. After cleaning the living room, I head into his bedroom. His bedroom is a lot like the rest of the place, metallic and bare. The room consists of dark sheets on a four-poster bed with two nightstands covered only with a few things. The right table has a lamp, a family picture, and a tissue box. Plus, a book. I pick it up and read the title. Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller. Interesting. I put down the book and look around. I see dry cleaning hanging on a chair, so I go into his walk-in closet to hang it up. His closet is bigger than my apartment. It even has a couch, a full-length mirror, and rows of suits, shirts, shoes, and little cabinets of ties, expensive watches, and cufflinks. The little shiny baubles blink at me, as if they're teasing me, bright and shiny, and totally not what I have in my closet. If you can call my two drawers of clothing stuffed in my bathroom a closet. I shake my head and focus on hanging up the clothes. Since I'm too short, I have to find a stepladder to hang some of them. I'm fine with the pants, but as I try to reach up to hook the shirts and suit jackets on the bars, I can't reach them. After doing that, I head to the kitchen before I notice that I forgot to clean a side table next to a leather-bound chair in the corner of the living room. I pick up the spray bottle and rub it down until it's squeaky clean. Who the hell are you? A voice says behind me. I yelp, spinning around and pressing myself against the wall, the spray bottle crushing into my chest as I hold it close. Standing before me is the most handsome man I've ever seen. I see sea blue eyes, and a chiseled face like it was made from marble and grease. Short, dark hair that's cropped shorter on the sides. His eyes are narrowed as he stares at me with intimidating power. Sophia told me he's a businessman, but she wasn't sure what kind of business. I also notice he looks a lot like the guy I spilled coffee on at my last job. I'm so very fucked. Chapter 2 Graham Who the hell are you? I ask, my voice making the small brunette woman slam her back against the wall, holding a towel and a spray bottle to her chest. I, um, she stutters. Speak, woman, before I call the police. I take out my phone, and she starts to panic. I'm your new housekeeper. Your sister hired me. Her words come out quickly, and her chest heaves as she pants. Sophia hired her and didn't tell me. Thank you so much, little sis. I was pulled out of a crucial meeting for this. My assistant told me she was notified that someone was in my apartment. I didn't know who it was, so I came straight home. I looked at the security video and saw a woman with tattered clothing who was picking up my stuff. I thought she might be stealing it. Why else would anyone be there? But looking at her now, her eyes full of fear, and the cleaning supplies in her hand, I think it's safe to say she's telling the truth. People rarely lie to me. They're too afraid. If there's anything I hate in the world, it's liars. I cocked my head and studied the woman in front of me. 
She's 5'5", with long dark hair and big brown eyes. She has on a snug gray t-shirt and leggings and a pair of old-looking running shoes. She has long lashes, high cheekbones, and bee-stung lips. Fuck, she's gorgeous. And she looks familiar. She clutches the cleaning supplies closer to her chest, and I notice how her breasts spill out of her shirt the closer she holds them. I can almost see the outline of her nipples from underneath her thin shirt. Focus, man. She works for you, apparently. Suddenly it hits me. The meeting. I know why I know her. She's the woman who spilled coffee on me at Dawkins General Store. I was there to see the manager, Stan McNamara, and the owner, Colin McAfee, who wanted to show me why I shouldn't buy his store. We were on the way to his office when she bumped into us, and I got hot coffee all over me. I didn't see her face clearly. When she looked at me, her thick hair was covering her face. I did see her right eye, and looking at this woman in front of me, I know it's her. I remember how Stan took her to the side, gripping her arm and scolding her like a child. I was about to pull him away when he let her go, and we continued walking. We didn't get to the meeting, but I have a feeling we're going to have words again. I looked the woman up and down. She really is gorgeous. Something in my chest shifts. My phone starts ringing. It's my sister on the line. Perfect timing, sis. Hey, bro. Her voice shatters my eardrum, and I pull the phone away from my ear. I hear construction work in the background. My sister hollers at them to keep it down for a sec. I just called to let you know I hired a housekeeper for you, she says, the background noise slowly quieting. You're kidding, I say, my voice dripping with sarcasm. Yes, and for the love of God, brother, don't fire this one. I'm not going to fire her. At the word fired, the brunette's eyes widen in fear. I shake my head, trying to reassure her that I won't fire her. Because she just got fired from her last job, and she really needs this one, okay? Be nice. Sophia punctuates each word, and I groan into the phone. Yes, mother, I drawl, and she hangs up after a few colorful swear words. The brunette is gripping the spray bottle so tight that her knuckles are white. I take a few steps forward until I'm directly in front of her. Her intoxicating scent fills my nose, making my cock twitch in my pants. I take the bottle and rag from her and put it on the table. What's your name? I ask as she wrings her hands. Brianna Cole, sir. The way she says sir is so innocent and sexy that for a moment, I forget she's my employee. I wonder what it would be like to have her long hair wrapped around my fist as I pound into her from behind, watching my cock disappear into her tight cunt and come out all shiny with her arousal. I undo my tie, suddenly feeling like it's too tight around my throat. Right, I say, and she jumps a little. Clearing my throat, I get to my point. You can continue your job. I'll be upstairs. Let me know when you're finished. I need to clear my head, so I walk up the stairs to my gym, and after changing out of my suit into some sweatpants and a t-shirt, I work out, trying to burn off some of the sexual frustration on the treadmill. It doesn't work, though. Usually, all I need is to get my blood pumping and the world's stresses slide away. But today... It makes me focus on what I want, and what I want is her. I want her under me, on top, and around me. I want her pretty pussy squeezing my cock, my lips on her, and her sweet scent surrounding me. But she works for me now, and based on what my sister said and her reaction to the word fired, it'd be heartless to get rid of her just so she can be mine. Even though she'd want for nothing with me, some people like to work. I couldn't take that from her. I'm maybe twice her age, and I didn't get to where I am from being a nice guy. Yet even I have lines I won't cross. 
I need a loophole where she can be mine and still have her job. There's a chance I could have her over a technicality. I mean, my sister hired her. Technically, she works for her, not me. I take that thought and run with it. Brianna is mine, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to have her. And when I do, I'm putting a ring on her finger and a baby in her belly. Chapter 3 Brianna Okay, this is not how I imagined my first day would go. After I saw who it was, I thought he'd fire me on the spot. If anything, because he thought I was an incompetent little girl who ran right into him with a hot cup of coffee. But the look he was giving me was anything but anger. He looked hot. Looks and temperature-wise. The way he pulled at his tie as he looked down at me was really, really attractive. I wanted to see him take more of his clothes off. I imagined what kind of body he has. He's older than me, but I saw a gym upstairs. Someone like him with a gym in his house would definitely be cut, right? I go back to cleaning the window, and as soon as I'm done, I do the last thing on the list, which is making meals for later. Sophia told me that he's a workaholic, and even though he can cook, he's like a camel who can go for a day without eating, and that's just not healthy. So if he has food he can grab, he's more inclined to eat. I look in his fridge, and it's stocked with delicious-looking food. Sophia gave me the option of cooking or ordering food, but I couldn't waste this food. So I pull out a bunch of vegetables and meats and get to work. Boiling, peeling, and mincing. I'm making a big pot of soup, pasta he can have tonight, and salads without dressing. The dressing goes into a bottle he can drizzle on fresh when he eats it. I cook some rice and make two different rice dishes that only need to be prepared in the microwave. By the time I'm done, it's dark outside. I didn't notice how time flew until I looked at the clock on the oven. 9 p.m. Oh, geez. I wonder if I'll get paid overtime. Something smells good, a voice from behind me says. I yelp and spin, only calming down when I see Mr. Donnelly leaning against the kitchen arch. Thanks, I say, turning around to tend to what's on the stovetop. He comes up behind me as I stir the soup. I can feel his body heat behind me, and it's hotter than the stove in front of me. He smells amazing, clean and musky. I look up and see his hair is wet. Um, so I have seven days' worth of meals here. The soup is not quite done, but I should go. So you can either turn it off now and cook it again later, or just leave it on, I tell him. I want to back up against his body so badly. I want to feel him against me, to feel his warm body cocooning around me. He reaches over, dips his finger into the soup, and brings it to his mouth. I follow his hand, watching him as he tastes my soup. He hums his approval and grins. That's very good, Bunny, he murmurs. My face blushes at the nickname and a big smile spreads across my face as I turn off the stove. Well, I think I should go, I say, and with great effort, I slide to the side and instantly feel the cool air on my back. I need to go home. I get my bag from the cubbyhole and head to the door. Mr. Donnelly meets me there and puts on his coat. Going somewhere, Mr. Donnelly? I ask him. He must have a date or something. A man as hot as him probably takes a different girl out every night of the week. I'm going to walk you home. And please, call me Graham. Oh, that's not necessary. I walk by him, open the door, and walk out, but he follows me. I wasn't asking, Bunny, he says, and pushes the elevator button. When we enter the elevator, I see our reflection in the mirrors. We're so different. He's tall, dresses well, and wealthy. I'm short, with hand-me-down clothing, 
and so close to getting kicked out of my apartment, I have a backpack for when the shit hits the fan. Despite my attraction to him, there's no way we would ever work. He deserves a leggy blonde with a law degree and a Porsche. If I could afford a car, the best I could do would be a 1989 Ford Fiesta. The elevator dings, and a couple enters the elevator. Graham takes me by the waist and pulls me closer, making room for the couple. His hand on my hip sends shivers through my body. His grip is firm but gentle, and the way I fit perfectly next to him makes all sorts of ideas run through my head. Fantasies where he and I could work. The elevator stops at the lobby. The couple walks out first, then we get out after. Graham still keeps his arm around me as we leave his building and head toward my apartment. I look at Graham's face as we approach my building. He seems scared, like he can't believe I live here. Not everyone can afford to live in palaces with marble countertops and housekeepers. Some of us have to clean our own apartments. I can get to my apartment on my own from here. Thanks for walking me. I walk up the stairs to my place, and Graham's behind me. He looks so out of place here, and every second he's here, any thoughts I had about us working out are shot down. I can't afford to delude myself. I won't risk my job because of a crush. We walk into my apartment, and I watch in anticipation as Graham inspects my place with its chipped paint and uneven floors. At least it's warm. Sometimes the heater doesn't work, but tonight it's rumbling along. You're not staying here, he says, looking around my apartment in horror. Well, I don't have anywhere else to go, looking at him confused. What about my clothes and apartment gives him the impression that I can just get another place at the drop of a hat? You're staying with me, he says. I'm sorry, I'm what? With me. I have an extra room at my place. You can stay there. You can't stay here. He waves around the apartment. The ceilings chose that moment to start leaking again. I don't want to say no. I want to go back with him. He makes me feel safe and secure. The second I walked into my apartment, all the fear, confusion, and distress of hunting for new jobs and not knowing how all Ford rent came back. At Graham's, there's a sense of stability. Um, okay. I nod, pick up my bag and sling it around my shoulder. I go to my drawers to get some clothes to stay in. I don't know how long I'll be there, but I pick a few when Graham enters the bathroom. That won't be necessary. I'll get some new clothes for you. Really? Yes. I'll get you anything you want, he says softly, caressing my cheek gently. I don't entirely trust those words, but I don't argue. I kneel down, open my drawer full of panties, and pull a few out. Those won't be necessary either, he says. I look up at him from the ground, his face serious. What? Am I going to walk around your place with no panties on? I laugh. The look he gives me is completely serious. Yes, Bunny, he says and walks out of the bathroom. I shove my panties back in their place and stand up. Checking myself in the mirror, I slap myself to see if this is real or a dream. I've been around rich guys, and they've given me the I'll rescue you shtick before. I'm not too fond of that. However, I have a feeling that isn't Graham's angle. I don't think casually doing favors like this is his thing, given how quickly he was ready to call the police the moment he saw me. Graham, I call out, approaching him in my kitchen, watching the water drip into a pan. Yes, Angel. My heart flip-flops at another nickname, but I shake my head, focusing on what I must say. Why are you doing this? I ask. He takes a few steps toward me until he's only a few inches away. Because I want to he says matter-of-factly. But you just met me. Yes. He cups my jaw and runs his thumb over my bottom lip. I have, but it only took one moment for me to know.
Now what? That moment I first saw you, you were mine. He bends down and kisses me. When his lips meet mine, my arms instantly go around his neck. He wraps his arms around me and holds me close. I inhale his scent and taste him as he slips his tongue into my mouth. He tastes like mint and man. I never believed in love at first sight, but I can't deny there was something between us, something almost unnatural, something on a chemical level, familiarity and a feeling of possession. Not only because I met him before, but in how he touches me, like we had this connection in another life. I lean into his warm body as his hand tangles in my hair. I moan against his lips, and a growl rumbles from his chest. His kiss is intoxicating. The thrilling sensations pour over me as he deepens the kiss. I feel like I'm on cloud nine. At this moment, I never want to go back. I can feel his erection between us, big and hard, unmistakable. My pussy pulses with need as thoughts of how he'd feel inside me float in my head. My panties get damp and I clench my thighs together. Graham hums against my lips, then pulls back. He looks at me with heat in his eyes and I swear he could burn all my clothes off just by looking at them. And I would welcome it. Come on, bunny. Let's go home. He takes my hand, and we walk out of my apartment. Maybe love at first sight does exist after all. Chapter 4 Graham When we return to my apartment, I take her into the bathroom and run a bath for her. I call my personal assistant to get clothes for her. While in my office, I make a call to my other assistant. Dennis, I want you to go by Dawkins General Store, I say, twirling a pen in my fingers. Um, why? Because I said so, I say sharply. All right, I'll do it right away. And after the sale goes through, I want you to fire Stan McNamara, I add. Why? He asks again, and I get irritated. Because I said, because you said so. Got it. Something in his voice says he wants to argue, but when I hear nothing else, I hang up the phone. I know buying a company is an extreme way to deal with your woman's bully, but I'm a man with means and want to use them. I would have gone to him in person and had words, but I don't want to leave Brianna home alone. It's taking every ounce of control not to go to the bathroom and watch her in the bath. All that silky water cascading across her skin, her nipples hard under the water, naked and warm. I grip my office chair harder as my cock strains against my slacks. Looking for some relief, I undo my belt and take out my throbbing cock. I groan as my fist wraps around it and start jerking off. I close my eyes, leaning back in my chair as visions of Brianna fill my mind. I imagine her in my bed, legs spread, panting as she begs for my cock. Please, sir, she moans, and I sink into her tight heat. I gather my pre-cum and rub it along my shaft as my imagination runs through the fantasy. I pound into her. Her nails dig into my shoulder and her legs wrap around my waist. Her smooth skin rubs against my chest. Her breasts heave with every pant of her breath. Good girl, I moan. I fuck her hard until she comes undone, then watch her face as pleasure takes her over. I come all over my hand and thighs. Thick ropes of cum drip down my shaft. I wish it were coating her pussy instead. It's an underwhelming and quick orgasm that does nothing for me. My cock still aches, and I know the only thing that'll help is Brianna. I knew that when I found the one, 
I'd immediately know. Brianna is mine, and I'm hers. After cleaning myself up, I head to the bathroom. My control is slipping, and I don't know how much longer I can wait. I need her like I need my next breath. When I get there, the bathroom door is open, and I lean against the doorframe and watch her. Brianna looks up from the suds she's cupping in her hands and gasps. Oh, I didn't see you there. She makes no move to be modest and cover herself or sink farther into the water. Instead, she continues to clean herself. My cock aches as I watch her run her hands over her arms, sliding the soapy rag over her naked body. She runs it over her neck and chest before slipping it under the water where she washes her breasts. She licks her lips, her eyes hooded with lust as she slips the washcloth deeper into the water. Her eyes flash as I assume she touches her pussy and I can't stand it anymore. I storm over to her and get in the bath. One foot follows the other into the water. I don't bother taking off my clothes. I pull her body to me, and she comes willingly. Grabbing the rag from her, I finish the job. My hand dives between her legs, and she moans, holding onto my arm as I drag the cloth over her throbbing clit. She looks at me with such innocent eyes that a thought I didn't think of before comes to mind. Are you a virgin, Bunny? She gives me a shy nod, and I swear I bust open my pants. That means I'm her first. Not only that, but I'm her last. My cock is the only one she'll know, and I'm going to make damn sure it's the best, second to none. I throw away the cloth, the cotton splattering on the floor, and use my hand. As soon as my bare hand touches her clit, she cries out and bucks in my arms. I hold her tighter against me and kiss her shoulder as I rub her clit in circles. Look at me, Bunny, I say. She looks up at me with hooded eyes. I want you to look at me while you come. Do you understand? I want to see those pretty eyes shine as you find your pleasure. She nods, and I speed up. I press my finger against her as I rub my finger over her clit. Over and over again until she starts to shake. That's it, Bunny. Let go. Let it all go and come for Daddy. Brianna comes with a silent cry, her lips parting, her eyes shut tight as she writhes in my arms. I lean down and kiss her lips swallowing every moan as her orgasm takes her over. The water splashes around us, coming out the sides onto the floor, but I don't care. All I care about is getting every drop of Brianna's orgasm. She pants in my arms, and I keep her there as I lift her from the water. She curls her body into mine, and I find a big terry cloth towel to wrap around her. I bring her into my bedroom, and remove my wet clothes before joining her in bed. Chapter 5 Brianna Graham kisses me with passion and urgency, like he needs me now more than he needs his next breath. He runs his hand over my wet, naked body. As the beads of water make me shiver, his hands warm me up. Now that he's naked, I can see what he looks like. As I thought, he's all muscle. Thick thighs, arms, and abs, with a light dusting of hair on his legs and chest. He even has a deep V on his hips that makes women wild. All lead down to his impressive length, which stands erect against his abdomen. It's big, thick, and long. Veins protrude along the sides and the head is red and dripping with pre-cum. I sink to my knees and wrap my hand around his length, bringing it to my lips. I lick the head, and Graham groans, sliding his hand into my hair and fisting it. His other hand cups my jaw. Good girl. He moans, and I shiver. 
I've never been called a good girl before, but I like it. And when he called himself Daddy, something in me felt like it woke up from a long hibernation. I've never thought about calling a man Daddy, but when I replay the word back in my head, it just feels right. Not only does the naughtiness of it make my pussy clench like a fist, but Daddy represents a man who looks after his woman. And this is something I've been craving for years. That's it, Bunny. He growls as I take more of him into my mouth. Ah, oh, fuck, baby. Your mouth is so warm and wet. Is your pussy wet for Daddy? I slide my fingers between my legs and run my finger against my slick folds. I nod as best I can, and he gives me a warm smile. Good. I want you to be dripping wet when I pop your cherry. I moan, and the vibrations of my voice make Graham curse and throw his head up as his grip on my hair tightens. It doesn't hurt. In fact, it feels pretty good. I bob my head up and down. He gets deeper and deeper until he touches the back of my throat. Fuck. He groans and pulls me off his cock. He cups my jaw and leans down. As much as I want to come down your throat and have you swallow my cum, I want to be in that little pussy even more. I shiver with anticipation. He lifts me and I land on the bed. I spread my legs and he leans down between them. I feel his fingers parting my folds and his tongue running across my pussy. I moan, sitting on my forearms and watching him lick my pussy. His tongue flicks over my clit, sending a rush of pleasure through my body. I grip the sheets and throw my head back, crying out as he sucks my clit and pushes a finger into my pussy. Fuck, you're so tight, Brianna. You're going to fit perfectly around my cock. Because you are made for me, Brianna. Made for daddy's cock. His words make me dizzy with lust. I think I agree. I think he's perfect for me, and I have no idea why. I just met him, but I know that my heart and body are his. He pumps a single digit in and out of my pussy while kissing me. My thighs, my folds, and my clit. I'm dripping down his hand. I know it. I've never been this wet. Even when I would touch myself, I'd never reached this point before. My arms can't hold myself up any longer, and my head hits the pillow as waves of burning pleasure flow through me. I feel my body tightening, my pussy clenching around Graham's fingers. That's it, Bunny. Come on, Daddy's fingers. He growls against my skin, and I shatter. My thighs shake and close around Graham's head. He pumps his finger rapidly, drawing out every inch of my orgasm as I cry out his name. Graham, oh my God, yes, fuck, that feels so good, yes. I see stars behind my eyelids, and I have no idea how long my orgasm lasts. The next thing I know, Graham is kissing up my belly between my breasts and sucking on the crook of my neck. My arms wrap around his shoulders, his body pressing against mine as his cock probes my entrance. Yes, I whisper, giving him permission to slip his cock inside me. You want daddy inside you, bunny? You want me to be your first and your last? He groans in my ear. I nod as he growls against my skin, making me shiver. Graham reaches down and runs his cock along my slippery folds. Open your eyes, Brianna, he says. My eyes shoot open and I stare into his bright blue eyes. They swirl with lust and the promise of pleasure. I see the pulse on his neck. He's straining for control. Taking a deep breath, he slowly pushes inside me. He sucked in a ragged breath as he entered me slowly. Ah, oh, fuck, Bunny. You're so fucking tight. As the pain starts, he leans down and kisses me. It's pinching, and the feeling is so foreign. Tears prick my eyes, but as quickly as the pain starts, it ebbs away as he rocks into me gently. 
He keeps his movements slow and shallow and coos softly to me. You're such a good girl, Brianna. Taking my cock like this, I promise this will never hurt again. He kisses my tears away and then starts to move once I've relaxed around him. Graham places his forearms on either side of my head, racing above me. Looking me in the eyes, he pushes past the barrier of my virginity. My pussy stretches around him, and I feel so full. With every rock of his hips, his cock brushes against my G-spot, causing my toes to curl in ecstasy. My ankles hook around each other as my legs wrap around his hips. Every thrust sends a new wave of pleasure through me. It builds and builds and shows no signs of stopping. Oh, my God, I moan. That's it, Bunny. Does Daddy's cock feel good in your sweet pussy? I nod as I claw at his shoulders, leaving little red lines on his skin. Graham braces one of my legs over his shoulder, opening me up more to him, and he thrusts even deeper. The sounds of our flesh slapping together is erotic, and the knocking of the headborn salacious. Every thrust stretches my pussy around his throbbing cock. Graham cups my face and rubs his thumb over my bottom lip. You gonna come for me, Bunny? Yes, Daddy, I whimper as I feel my body tense. I can feel the buildup of the tide threatening to pull me under. I hold on tight to Graham as he reaches down and rubs my clit. My pussy tightens around his cock and my world explodes. A wave of pleasure hits me, pulling me into the depths where all I feel is hot, searing ecstasy. Graham pulls my legs off his shoulder, takes my knees, and spreads my legs wide as he roars his release above me. He pounds into me as he empties himself into my pussy. I don't care that he isn't wearing a condom. I'm on birth control, and I want to feel this. The sensation of his skin against mine and the heat of his cum exploding inside me. I scream to the ceiling as my climax goes on and on. Graham, I cry out. Oh, my God, Daddy. That's it, Bunny. You feel my cum inside you, filling you to the brim? I shake until it rolls through me. Then I lay panting, sweat coating my skin as it buzzes. Graham kisses my face as I feel him twitch inside me. I'm sorry, he says and slips out of me. My brows furrow, and I cup his jaw to get him to look at me. For what? Fear grips me at the number of thoughts running through my brain. Does he regret this? Is he going to leave me? I wasn't wearing a condom, he says. But I got tested a couple of weeks ago, and I'm fine, he says quickly. I let go a sigh of relief. That's okay. I'm on birth control. He palms my stomach, and I cover his hand with my own. Even if I wasn't on birth control... I wouldn't be unhappy about what may come out of this. I've wanted a family since I was a little girl, but the way my life had been going, it seemed like something I'd never have. Looking at how Graham possessively touches my body as he watches me stroke my belly, I dream for the first time that it may happen. I let myself believe I could have the dream. Graham nuzzles my neck and mutters against my skin. What's that? He pulls back and smiles. I said I love you. I gasp and smile back. Really? My chest jumps for joy. Yes. I knew I'd recognize her instantly when I met the one. And I recognize you, Brianna. You're mine, Bunny, he says, rubbing his nose over mine. Holy shit. He loves me. Chapter 6 Brianna Tears pricked my eyes, a reaction I didn't see coming. It occurs to me that no one has ever told me they love me. Not that I can remember. 
My parents were gone before I could retain any memory of them, so I don't know if they told me how they felt. Brianna. Graham coos and holds me closer. I'm fine. I sniffle and nuzzle his chest, running my fingers through his light dusting of hair. No, you're not. Don't lie to me, bunny. I trace little infinity signs on his skin as I tell him about my past. I'm an orphan. No family has ever accepted me, and the system let me go at 18. I've been working since then. That's why when you said fired, I got scared. I don't want to be let go from another job. The last four years have been nonstop hiring and firing. My whole life, I've done everything for myself. I like being independent, but I don't particularly appreciate being ignored. And when you said I love you, I've never had anyone say that to me. Not even in passing. I pull back to look him in the eyes. I love you too, Graham. I know we barely know each other, but I understand what you mean about knowing who your person is when you see them. And it's you. I love you, Graham. Graham kisses me on the forehead and cups my face. I love you too, Brianna. You're mine, and I'm yours. You'll never want for anything. I promise I'll take care of you and never leave you. Graham's cock hardens between us, and I reach down, wrapping my hand around his heavy girth, and begin stroking it slowly. Oh, Bonnie. He moans. Yes, Daddy, I say, and a shiver of delight runs through me. Graham flips me over, and his cock falls out of my hand. He lifts me until I'm on all fours and kneels behind me. His large hand caresses my ass and then parts my cheeks. I feel his tongue graze my asshole. I gasp as something forbidden rushes through me. This little hole will be mine, Bunny, he says, his voice gruff and full of promise. Yes, Daddy. I moan. They're all yours. I don't know what I'm saying, but it feels right. Good girl. I feel his cock nudge my pussy and his hand wraps around my long hair. He pulls my head back by my hair and the tug is enough to make me shiver. Arousal leaks from my pussy. His free hand grips my hip and he pushes in with one thrust, mounting me from behind. My pussy is sore from the first round, but all is forgotten when he gets going. I feel his balls slap my clit as he pushes forward. My ass smacks against him, and he grunts. I love watching my cock disappear into your cunt, Bunny. I shiver at his words, and he takes notice. Every time I say a naughty word, you shiver. Do you like Daddy's dirty mouth, Bunny? Do you like it when I whisper filthy things into your ear? He bends over me, and I feel his hot breath against my neck. Do you want Daddy's mouth on your pussy? I nod, and he pulls back, gripping my hips with both hands as he pounds into me. You come for me now, and I'll make you come again with my tongue, Brianna. He says, and I grip the sheets as my orgasm builds. My pussy pulses around him, and I lean down and bite the pillow as I come. This one is stronger than the last. My body feels like it's in another realm, another world where all I feel is pleasure, where the exhilaration of flying is constant, taking me to another level of consciousness. Graham flips me onto my back. I'm still shuddering from my orgasm when he puts his mouth on me. He licks my pussy, his rough tongue flattening against me. He laps at me, and I look down for a second and see him jerking off as he devours me. You taste divine, Bunny. He moans and sucks my clit. Oh my God, Daddy, yes. He plunges two fingers inside me and finger fucks me into another orgasm. Fuck, yes, Daddy, I'm coming. I cry out and wrap my legs around his head. I grip his hair and hold him against my pussy until I collapse on the bed. My arms and legs fall until I'm spread eagle on the bed, 
panting and satisfied. The wanton need is sated for now. Graham lays next to me, still stroking his cock. I try to reach down to finish him, but he pins my wrist to the bed. Shh. Let me just look at you, bunny. He watches me as he strokes his cock. He pets my sensitive skin and uses my arousal to lube his cock until he comes. Thick ropes of cum spurt out of him, covering my skin as he groans his release. Then he rubs his seed into my skin, claiming me. You are mine, Brianna, he says, leaning down and rubbing his nose against mine. Yes, Daddy, I smile. And you're mine. Yes, I'm yours. We lay in bed, cuddling for a long time. By the time we wake up, it's the following day. Bright light shines into his room, and he's still there. I look up at him and notice he looks younger when sleeping. Maybe it's because he seems more relaxed. I run my fingers over the small stripes around his eyes. There's something that tugs at my heart. The fact that he's still here. Sophia said her brother is a workaholic and has no time for anything else. But it's 10 a.m., and he's next to me, holding me close. Security matters most to me, and not feeling like a ward. Grandma's given me security. Only I can make myself not feel like a burden to him. If this relationship is to continue, I need to find a new job where I don't work for the man I love. I know he said I'll want for nothing, but that isn't the point. He can have every penny on earth, and I'll still want to have a job. Graham shifts on the bed and slowly opens his eyes, catching me staring at him. Hello, Bunny, he says, his voice rough with sleep. It's so sexy. He stretches, and I see every flex of his muscles. I touch my lip to ensure I'm not drooling when the sheets show the gorgeous Adonis belt on his hips. The blanket stops short of releasing his cock, but the tent makes me bite my lip. You sore? He asks, petting my hair. A little bit. Not enough to dampen my desire for you. I crawl on top of him, and he lets me straddle him. Greedy girl, he groans. Well, you must have known how insatiable I'd be. After all, you call me Bunny. I lean down and kiss his soft lips. His hands cup my ass, and he massages each fleshy cheek. Hmm, <laughs> I suppose you're right, he murmurs. I guess that also means you'd like to be bred like one, over and over again. Will you make me a daddy outside the bedroom, Brianna? I shiver. Yes, daddy. Graham flips me over and sinks into me with one thrust. Ah, oh, fuck. He groans. Still so fucking tight. By the time he's done with me, we've had sex twice in his bed and once in the shower. My pussy is sore, but I'm satisfied and not unhappy about the ache. Today we're going to my apartment to tell my landlord I'm leaving and packing my stuff. I feel good about my decision, but there's one thing that I will need to talk to Graham about. My job. I can't keep working for him, so I'll need another job. I put on a yellow sundress. It was hanging in the closet with a dozen other dresses and a note saying they were mine. Rows of dresses, shirts, pants, and skirts line the wall. I had a hard time picking something out. They're all so beautiful. On the ground lay several pairs of shoes, and I tried on every one of them. I'd never had so much stuff. Everything I own can fit into a large backpack. But eventually, since I'm feeling sunny and fresh today, I put on small white heels to go with the bright yellow dress that flares out from the hips. I look like a giant sunflower. I wear a light jacket and head to my apartment alone. Graham wants me to wait at his place and go with him, but I tell him I'm a big girl and I can walk to my place by myself. When I get there, 
My head swims with memories of my time there. It's amazing how quickly being here started to feel so foreign. It felt normal when I lived here only two days ago. Now it feels like another world. The apartment isn't great, but I was okay. Now that I've stepped into luxury, being at this apartment feels worse than before. I put the key into the lock, and when I enter, the smells remind me of more difficult times. Like when I came running home in the rain because I didn't have an umbrella and I had to lay my clothes on the radiator to dry. I sit on the bed and look around my room. There's a part of me that doesn't want to forget this. I don't want to forget how hard I've worked. Something about not having to worry about where my next meal was coming from freaks me out. It feels temporary. Like someday, I'll wake up and find myself back in this shitty apartment. I fidget, and my mind is so preoccupied that I don't hear Graham walk in until he knocks on my bedroom door. Oh, hi, I say, and he sits beside me. Penny for your thoughts? Graham rubs my back and kisses me on the top of my head. Just thinking about this place, I wave my hand across the small room with the broken window leading to the fire escape. Well, after we're done here, you never have to return. He pulls me onto his lap, and I can't seem to look him in the eyes. Funny, he says, his voice laced with concern. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong, and that's the issue. What do you mean? He tips my head up, forcing me to look at him. Listen, I love you. I start with the absolute truth. I can't imagine my life without you, and even though we met less than 24 hours ago, I know how I feel about you. Just this thing is on my mind, and I need you to be okay with it. His brows furrow, but he nods. As much as I appreciate moving in with you, I really do. I just don't want a savior. So if you're only doing this because you want to save the poor orphan girl, I really need you to stop. I say quickly and wait for his response. Oh, Brianna, I'm not, I swear. I sigh and my shoulders come down a bit. I'm doing this because I love you. I want you in my life. If it's too soon, then we don't have to do it now. I can wait. His hands twitch at my sides. I believe him when he says he can wait, but I know he doesn't want to. To be honest, neither do I. I can shut down this chapter of my life as long as I have my independence. We don't have to wait, but what I need is a job. I have money, he says, but I stop him, cupping his cheek. It's not about what you have. It's about what I have. I was sitting on this bed thinking about what if this is all a fever dream and one day I wake up and everything is gone. Well, I want to know I won't end up with nothing. I need to be independent. I need to do my own thing. So that means I can't work for you, but I'm going to get a job and I'm going to pay for things myself. I need to know that I can be on my own while being with you instead of you doing everything for me. Don't get me wrong, I love it when you draw a bath for me, and I don't think you'll leave me, but I have to know I can do things on my own. I breathe in and breathe out. It feels freeing to say that out loud. Often, I've been at the whim of what someone else needs, doing what I can to make them happy so I'll have a job. But this was for me. I'm nervous about what he'll say. But then he nods. Okay, Bunny. Yeah, I smile. Yes, Brianna, you're right. I'm not saying that I'm going to stop spoiling you, but if you want a job, I won't stand in your way. I wrap my arms around him and pull him close. I kiss him on his soft lips as I melt into his body. This is incredible. I get the man of my dreams, and I get to develop a backbone. Who knew spilling coffee on a guy would get me the life I could only imagine?
Now I don't have to dream about it. It's real and mine. I pack my few belongings and get my affairs in order. I don't bother bringing any of the furniture. I just take my personal stuff. Despite Graham's grumbles about him not wanting me to wear them, I bring my old clothes, panties, and some pictures along with my camera. I got into photography as a way to deal with everything. Taking snapshots of a flower or a smiling couple reminds me of joy in life, even when I was stuck in the mud. As I shut the door behind me and lock it, I feel a small sense of letting go. Letting go of the uncertainty and fear and stepping into a new space where I can stand firm and take the lead with the man I love. Chapter 7 Graham I take Brianna back to my place. I pull her into my arms as soon as I shut the door. At first I was reluctant about her getting a job, mostly because she'd be away from me. Apparently, my possession knows no bounds. Then I considered, what if the roles were reversed? How would I feel if someone who said they loved me wouldn't let me live my life? I couldn't live with myself if I did that to her. Brianna is the love of my life and I want her to be happy. If getting a job will make her happy, I'll do whatever it takes to get her one, though I suspect she'll want to do it herself. But while she's in my arms, I'll be the one doling out the pleasure. I toss her onto the couch, her body facing the back. She sits on her knees, facing the window overlooking the city. I pull up her dress and squeeze her soft ass cheeks, pulling them apart, revealing her slick pussy and puckered asshole. Sliding my finger through her slick folds, I hear her moan as I use her arousal to rub her back entrance. Whose hole is this, bunny? I growl against her ear. Yours, daddy. She mules and pushes against my finger. Do you want daddy's cock in your ass? I press more against her until the tip of my finger is inside. Yes, yes, I want it, I want it. I reach over to the table and pull out a bottle of lube, squirting it on my finger and then massaging her tight hole. My cock throbs inside my jeans as I work at her ring of muscles until I'm inside, my finger sinking into her to the knuckle. Oh my God, Daddy, yes. She purrs and fucks herself on my finger. I reach around her and play with her clit, grinding myself against her, trying to find relief as she moans with pleasure. I can feel pre-cum drip down my leg. My cock wants inside her badly. I look up and see her reflection in the window. Her eyes screw shut and her soft tits bounce underneath her pretty dress. I pull back and lift the yellow fabric off before throwing it across the room. Look at you, bunny. Her eyes open, and they lock with mine. She grips the back of the couch as I take out my aching cock and position it at her forbidden entrance. You ready for me, bunny? She nods, and I slowly push inside her tight hole. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I growl as she envelops me. Holy shit. Brianna gasps as I sink into her. I reach around and thumb her clit as I start fucking her ass. Fuck, you're so fucking tight. I'm not going to last. I warn her as my balls draw up. I haven't been inside her for 30 seconds and I'm already set to blow. She reaches her hand around and grabs my hair, looking me right in the eyes as she says, Fuck me, daddy. So I do. I pound into her, my thighs slap against hers, her ass jiggles along with her breasts. I treasure the look of pure pleasure on her face as she peeks and rides the wave of her orgasm. Then I come, filling her ass with my seed. As I climax, I call out her name, the love of my life, my Brianna, my bunny.
This has been Boss of Me by Isla Glass. Read for you by Megan Kelly. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Isla Glass, for bringing us Boss of Me. Can't wait to listen to it. Super excited. Um, if you're an Alexa Riley fan, um, make sure you check out, hopefully it'll be live by now, the Stolen to Remember series bundle. Um, they were all previously released, but we bundled them together to do a uh, signed paperbacks on our website. So I mean, we a bunch have, of the links are up. We've just been waiting on one link. That's yeah, the, the script one, I think, is a, that is not working. So we're just waiting on that one to, to go live before we share. But it should hopefully be up by the time you hear this. And if you want signed Alexa Riley paperbacks, you can go to our website, alexarelli.com, and they're at the top where it says shop. So get on there and get that. And then um, I think that's it. I think that's it for now. Okay. Oh, wait. Up next week, we have um, Lacey Thorne with Piper's Perfect Mate. So make sure you come back. We're going to play it. Tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. You could take a look in a book that's fine. Or you could sit back, relax, and unwind. And read me romance. Read, read me romance.